Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please join me in welcoming presentation of colors by the Esperanza High School Air Force JROTC and a national anthem by Aladra Rupp. Sorry. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through. For the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the We need to thank uh, Ms. Rupp. This is her first time she's been at the Richard Nixon Foundation, and I think we'll see her many more times. Thank you. So officially, welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. My name is Bill Barabalt. I'm the president and CEO of the foundation. This afternoon, I was in Los Angeles taking part in a program honoring someone very special to us here in Yorba Linda at her alma mater, the University of Southern California, the 47th First Lady of the United States, the wife of the 37th President, Pat Nixon. We began with a video of former First Ladies paying tribute to Mrs. Nixon, and among them were the grandmother and mother of our speakers this evening, First Ladies Barbara and Laura Bush. Pat Nixon accomplished mightily throughout her life, overcoming trials and personal tragedies to earn the respect and admiration of millions across the world. She was voted to the list of America's most admired women for 22 years. She inspired the country through her commitment to charity and traveled on official visits to 81 countries. Like the parents of our speakers today, President Nixon and First Lady Pat Nixon were dedicated to their families and also the parents of two young women, Tricia Nixon-Cox and Julie Nixon-Eisenhower. Aside from being part of a distinguished and presidential family, the daughters and the granddaughters of presidents, Jenna and Barbara Bush, are also accomplished in their own right. They also happen to be fraternal twins, and for the historians among us, the only twins in White House history. Please join me in watching a video that presents Barbara and Jenna. 
been so much fun. It's been such a fun process, and I think it's been good for us as sissies and a lot of fun to remember, have a reason to remember all these stories that we hadn't thought of. sampler of the book. You know, people would say, that must have been so hard. And I'm like, no, it's not that hard, you know? Magnificent Ocean and his wild crew of family members gleefully racing to the welcoming shelter of our home port with him. I feel like now is a good time for women to come together to celebrate each other. Yeah. And that's what you've always done for me. Celebrate me. Celebrate you. Have I celebrated you? You've celebrated that's you're, me. That's what you're supposed to say. I know, I knew you were going to You that. two have celebrated me, sissy. But you just are elusive and you held that back for some reason. Together, Jen and Barbara have written a superb new book that they'll be discussing tonight, Sisters First, Stories from Our Wild and Wonderful Life. And it's our understanding that it will be released as the number one New York seller here soon. Tonight's program is going to be moderated by Su Shin Park. Ms. Park is the on-air correspondent for Daily Candy. You may also know her from her work on MTV, covering the network's movie awards and the Sundance Film Festival, as well as hosting the pre-Grammy show in Cribs. Please welcome Barbara, Jenna, and Su Jin. like a whole other yes we other thought the section. East Room ended and also I was talking with the ladies and you were saying this was the most regal room that you had yes y'all are so been. regal yes so, that's what she said she said y'all are so regal that's actually what she said I was trying to make it sound more more stuffy than it was um, so thank you guys for sharing this evening with us and thank you sisters for inviting me um, I cried, I laughed, I cried a little through reading the whole book. So it was a range of emotions and it was just such a personal account of such a public life. I mean, your entire family. I really wasn't expecting that. I thought it was gonna be a little bit of history, a little bit of stuff we already knew, but so much of it was just straight from the heart. I don't know if it was journals, there were texts in there, letters from your parents. I'm like, did anyone edit this? Like, is this allowed? <laughs> Um, were there, I mean, you must have, I mean, put, putting the book together, was it just sort of like nothing was held back and you kind of wanted to put it all out there and nobody said, eh, maybe not that text from your dad and that emoji, it's very unpresidential. I mean, that's what I was thinking, but I was like, wow, this is so cool. It's a real peek into this life. So tell me about that kind of write, that writing process and how personal it was for you guys. Definitely. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming and thank you for joining us. Um, so when we decided to write the book, I it took me a longer time to decide to write <laughs> the book. She's elusive. I've been intentionally <laughs> private. I'm a little more private than my sister and that has been a decision. And so when we decided to write the book, I it took me a longer time to think about saying yes because I knew if we were going to do it, then we did need to be vulnerable and authentic and share both the great and the difficult. Mm -hmm. And so once we did, we did just that. And yeah. um, what, what do you think was that convincing, you know what I mean? What was that thing that convinced you? Because that it is kind of a big decision. Was it me? Was it me? <laughs> Peer oh. pressure. Your sister pressure? She's, um, <laughs> she's a little bossier than I am, so it was partially her. <laughs> um, but also, we um, were twins. And we've always been so lucky to have each other as our partner and had someone that had our back fully and um, loved us and believed in us, which has allowed us to be more brave in everything that we've done. And we 
started, we always daydreamed about writing a book, um, and we started daydreaming about it more and more as Jenna had her second daughter, hmm. Poppy. She had had a two-year-old. She already had Mila, who was two. Yeah. And we wanted to get... Oh, well, that's not oh, Mila that's and us. Poppy. That's just us. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, wow. We were cute. <laughs> we were very cute. <laughs> we, and my mom had this great idea. She sent a picture of Barbara and me when we were the same age, Mila was, and I'm holding Barbara so tight that there's a scratch mark on her neck. And she was like, now Mila, you're gonna have a baby sissy. Mommy and Auntie Barbara are sisters, and you're gonna have this. And we talked to her a lot because two-year-olds don't really understand um, what a gift it is to have a sibling. And now she totally gets it. She's in love with her baby sister. Um, the other day she said, Mommy, Poppy's going to rule the world. <laughs> Which I thought was the sweetest thing for a four-year-old to say about her baby sister. And I said, well, maybe Poppy could rule the world. Maybe Poppy could be president. And she said, but Mom, presidents are all men. <laughs> Which sort of broke my heart as a mother of two girls, frankly. Um, and I think, you know, we want our girls to know... Um, I'll call them your girls too, that they can be whatever they want to be. Mm. And not just my daughters, but other daughters. Um, <laughs> and that one of the things that make women feel uplifted or make anybody feel uplifted is to have this circle of sisterhood, whether it's best friends like my, or blood sisters like my twin, who always made me feel like I was enough, or the women I work with who are incredible, or my, my good friends, and I know Barbara feels the same way about some of her, even our college roommate that's here today. Yeah. Two of them are here. They drove. <laughs> they made a long journey to be here. Yeah. So we, we just felt like maybe by sharing yeah. our stories, it would encourage other women to lift each other up. Now, um, I, I want to start off the evening as well, kind of getting descriptions, how you guys describe each other. And I want to say it within the context of how it is very much like the perception that could be out there of you two and how it isn't. Because there probably is a bit of truth and not a lot of truth in some of that. So I was curious, just, just because so much of this book is about kind of the myths and, and, and the stuff you realized, you're like, wow, I just read that headline and it was something I believed and I didn't even think about it twice. And then reading the book, I was like, that's a, that's a completely different, you know, I just stored that away as fact. So having you two here, I wanted to kind of hear from your guys' point of view. Well, I think people have a perception that I'm, um, or I was a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> And I think... Um, true, I mean, not I guess, true. Yeah, true and not true. <laughs> not true now when I'm like I'm the mother of two kids and want to be asleep by 8.04. And really, I've always been a little bit of a homebody. But yeah. Barbara's, I think Barbara's perception, I'll describe her, yeah. I'll do what you yeah. said, um, is that, um, you know, people will say, oh, she's the quiet one. And she's not at all quiet. It's just that because we're twins, I feel like people think we need to be the inverse of each other, that we should be opposites. Um, and because we were such public sisters. So even now, at the age of 35, I, I almost rounded us down. I know. Do you appreciate she usually that? rounds us up. I'm like, why would you well, say we turn 36. that we're older than we are publicly? Okay. <laughs> However old I am, even now at this age, somebody will be like, oh, you're the one that's loud, right? Or whatever it is. And I think in our culture now, more than ever, it's easier to just stereotype people than to really try to get to know them. Maybe with the rise of social media, it's easier to headline people and, and not really know the nuance. So Barbara, people will say, oh, she's quiet, right? She's the quiet one? And she's not at all. I mean, she started a global health nonprofit. She's independent as can be. She, her commute is to Rwanda. Um, <laughs> so that takes, and she's given like an incredible TED talk. So I think that's the stereotype that is not correct. And then there is some, you know, she is private and elusive as can be. <laughs> I think that's a compliment. Um, <laughs> Jenna is, I mean, I always broke my heart because people will say, like, your sister's the troublemaker or she's the wild one. And we're both wild. And in fact, um, 
we put our subtitle of our book is Stories from Our Wild and Wonderful Life. And when we went to our publisher to tell them that we wanted to do that, they looked at us and were like, you know what people are gonna think, they're gonna think you're wild. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, no, no, we know. We're trying to take back the word wild. And it's actually based on, um, it's based on a Mary Oliver poem that I'll just read the end of, that we love, our little grandmother, who Jenna is named after, Jenna Welch, who's 97 and lives in West Texas, used to read this to us when we would lay in the front yard with her at night looking at the stars. And it ends, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And we always loved that because yeah. it is wild. I never would have thought Jenna would be on NBC 10 years ago, and I don't think she thought that either, just because life no. goes in directions you wouldn't have thought of. Um, so while Jenna is louder and less elusive than me, she is not in any way a troublemaker. She's, um, she is a lot of fun, though, and I write about this a lot in the book. My sister is makes every experience fun. We're about 12 days in on our book tour right now. We've gone to a city a day for the past 12 days, and it has been a total blast, and we're also really proud of ourselves. We haven't gotten into a single argument. But <laughs> tonight may be the night. No, tonight we're not going to <laughs> I feel it in the air. <laughs> Something special. <laughs> but she, the reason it's been so fun is because Jenna is so fun, and that's a choice. You, it takes the same amount of mental energy to choose to make something great, or something negative, and I have had that all my life, and I write a lot about that. She um, loves making people laugh, and she loves making people smile, and she was a real performer when we were little. She um, had her sights set on Broadway, and I write about our mom driving us around in her minivan, taking to Jenna to a lot of different local theater tryouts. I never, never got the part. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be little Cosette. And um, Les Mis. She and had a Les little Feel free if you want to bust room. out in a... That's all the, crowd. <laughs> the problem is I was like a well-fed, blonde Texan, and I'm like, what part of this does not scream the French Revolution? Um, and it was... It just... My look... Oh, I thought maybe their picture was right up there, but they were just laughing at me. <laughs> anyway, thank you, sissy. <laughs> um, there is... Um, you know, like I said, there is so much uh, emotional uh, range that you guys cover in this book, but there is a lot of humor. And right off the bat, um, Barbara, I want you to tell the group who haven't had a chance to, to read the chapter on your famous name. And oh gee, there's so many great stories in there. And I just, you know, the book is written chronologically, so you can imagine you know, of course, as any ch elementary school child or um, carrying around this very big name <laughs> and what you have to do to just like hide it under your coat, you know what I mean? <laughs> just like shove it in a corner. So um, it just, it was, it was so funny uh, reading that chapter. So I wanted to kind of give the audience a taste of what that was. Definitely. So, so my name is Barbara Bush. <laughs> For those of you that don't know. For those that didn't know. And my grandmother was the wife of the vice president when we were born. So my mom claimed she didn't think that I would have a big name, except <laughs> now, as we're older, we're like, except she was the vice president's <laughs> wife. That could have gone somewhere, you yeah. know? She was like, we had no idea that Ganny was going to be famous. <laughs> we were like, what? She was like, we would have never named Barbara that. We're like, she was the vice president's wife. <laughs> So anyway, I, it took me a long time to realize that um, my grandmother was recognizable. And so long, actually, that I also lived under the belief that every grandfather was president. <laughs> I thought you became president because you were a grandfather. <laughs> so I was thrilled after we went to our grandfather's inauguration, thinking that I had dozens more inaugurations that I got to go to because I thought all my, gra my friends' grandfathers were going to get an inauguration. <laughs> so it took me a while to realize that, and it took me a very long time to realize that my name meant anything. So when we were young, I would call and order pizza and <laughs> immediately be hung up on. Because can you imagine when Barbara Bush was the first lady, there's like a little girl, and it's like, who, yes, who do you want pizza for? Barbara Bush! <laughs> 
everybody thought, and this was when prank calling was particularly Yeah, and we prevalent. were into prank calling. But I didn't know, I always felt ashamed, but I didn't know why. I thought I had done something wrong, but I couldn't really piece it together. This has continued all my life. Um, two years ago, I went to give a talk about Global Health Corps, and I showed up, and I was kind of milling about, thinking that the person that was hosting the talk might greet me, <laughs> and I just was milling still. And someone came up and was like, are you her intern? <laughs> And I, I thought she meant my intern. I didn't know what they were talking about. They thought my grandmother <laughs> was coming to give the talk two years ago. <laughs> and then there's one real classic story that I'll share. And for, there's many gentlemen here, so I'm sorry to share this. But um, this, is not, this is extended outside of me. One of my cousins a few years ago typed me an email. The subject line was, bikini waxing or electrolysis? She wrote the email, and the first sentence was, yo, what up? And then the whole email was this sort of questioning, should she get a bikini wax? Should she get laser hair removal? What do I think? And she pressed send, and it autofilled my grandmother's email address. <laughs> but even better, my grandmother replied, she didn't bat an eyelash. She said she did not wax. She recommends staying away from harsh products like Nair. <laughs> <laughs> and she was looking forward to seeing my cousin that summer in Maine. She's like, of course this is for me. What up? Hey, girl. And sadly, the name Barbara is going extinct. <laughs> it's on the very, very... Not fast. after this tour, ladies. I'm telling Bring you. Bring it back. A spike. You know what I mean? We hope so. Yeah. Bring um, it back. Uh, I also wanted to talk about um, one of my favorite chapters in the book, uh, Mothership. Um, and uh, gosh, what can I say? I have, I have so many, like this question is like half this page because I, I think I related to it being a new mom and then I was thinking about you being a mom and then I was thinking about how I also knew really nothing about your mother because the chapter is 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 very i mean it's just so personal and and it is such a such a daughter's point of view and you say in here that um that this chapter you know with your the relationship with your mother was very quote unquote complicated and i just i just found that to be so incredibly relatable and so honest i think it was the I just knew that like when I read that I was like, oh these girls aren't messing around. They're gonna they're gonna just say the truth and say what's been on their mind. So I wanted to talk about that chapter and what it was like um, putting that together and and why it was important for you to be that honest about your mom and your relationship with her. Well, I adore my mom um, and but I think mother daughter relationships in general can be complicated. And she knew that. Um, I write about in the chapter, one night I got home, I was staying with my parents in DC and she had read an editorial in the Washington Post about how mothers see themselves and their daughters. And you know, this was the time period where we wore the low jeans, believe me, they were never a good luck. <laughs> um, but she would say like, pull up your jeans or get your hair out of your face or whatever. And it was just like, Okay, well, all right, mom, you know, but she knew it. She was really just, um, and she read this article and she saw herself in it. Mm -hmm. She saw that she was, you know, asking us to do things because it was things that she really was asking herself to do. I mean, that was the basis of the article. So I got home one night and she'd left it on my desk with this really lovely um, letter about how she knows that it can be complicated to be, to be, this relationship can be complicated. And what I've realized now as a mom is that m mothers just want the best for their kids. Um, you know, you're, you're desperate to have children that are happy. And, that, and our mom wanted kids so badly. Um, I did some research about the maternal side of my family um, because we knew that my mom had infertility problems. We, they tried to get pregnant with us for five years. Um, they put in adoption papers, and on the day they got accepted to adopt, they found out they were pregnant mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. um, and then my grandmother 
Jenem, who I'm named after, had my mom, she was an only child, but she'd actually buried three babies. My mom's first memory is looking into a, a nursery knowing that her little baby brother wouldn't live. Um, and so our mom was so, wanted children so much, and we knew that. Um, but I think, and, and so, you know, that was the luckiest thing because we always, always felt loved. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people were like, well, does this mean, you know, your mom, y'all don't get along? We get along wonderfully. And But I think what we realized is that the inverse of being an only child or the opposite of being an only child is to be twins. <laughs> so what she wanted was to have two kids so much. But then we would... We, and she even, somebody asked her yesterday, did you ever feel, and maybe it's because they read the book, like a little left out? Because Barbara and I, I, I was giving my girls a bath the other day, and I was like, please don't drink the bath water. And then Mila drank the bath water, and Poppy drank the bath water. And they were laughing together, and I was the odd man out. But I remembered doing yeah. the same thing with my sister. Um, and my mom didn't have that. She didn't have anybody to play off of. And so somebody asked her, we were with her, was that yesterday? <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, did you ever feel a little left out? And she was like, I still do, <laughs> you know? Um, but she, you know, I, I admire her so much. And what I admire most is that she taught us really how to, there's so many different ways to use your voice. Yeah. And I have a grandmother, um, we have a grandmother, who Barbara happens to be named after, who used her voice in a hilarious and loud way and, um, and was, is very, very strong and opinionated. And our mother is equally opinionated, um, but she uses her voice in a different way. And, and she taught us that it was important to care about things and to use our voice. And I, now I try to be a little bit more like our mom. But I hope, does that make sense? It is complicated to talk about it. I, I adore her. People were like, does this mean you don't love your mother? I'm like, no, I adore her. Yeah. I just realized also that kids don't realize their parents are humans, you know? Like, <laughs> when I was little, I'm like, why doesn't mom, you know, why does mom bother us about this? And it's like, there was so much in her early life that caused her to, to be the type of mom she was, just as there's so much in my early life that has shaped me to be the mother that I am. Yeah. And, um, and it was really interesting to think about. Yeah, and Barbara, what about you sort of reading that and, and hearing this about your guys' relationship with your mom? I just think that while she's obviously not the, you know, the, the men, the presidents, they get the spotlight. So it was so nice to have this moment with your mom, do you know what I mean? Just as a mom, because um, you just never really got that side of her, even from her, because you know she is so reserved. Um, so I'm just curious what you think. Well, I, I love that question because I think we often forget what, I mean, especially with President and First Lady, you forget that they're also living a life outside of what we're looking at in terms of um, someone actually wrote this great Time article, Time Magazine article that was about our book, but she said, you know, you forget that people's heart might be broken mm -hmm. and you just see this one side of them and forget that they're living a, a life, you know, that we could all relate to, but we forget to even think that they're humans in that way. And um, our mom has been the best mother in the world. I think we just didn't, really, until we wrote this book, it did not occur to us at all that twins would be the most hard thing for her to understand because she didn't even have any siblings. And um, yeah. and also, as Jenna said before, you kind of think that your parents didn't even have a life before you arrived. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we would find out these things. I remember when Jenna found out that my dad had been engaged when he was 21. Oh, yeah. It was like the end of the world. No, I mean, I had to sleep in between my parents every night, and I was too old. I was like <laughs> 15. And it had been, I was like, you were going to get a divorce, and you're leaving her for that lady that you were engaged to. And he was like, no. This was like, you know, 15 years ago. I'm like, I know what's happening. Why would you never have told us about her? And he was like... <laughs> I mean, I was dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> and I was and I was young. I wasn't 15. I was maybe eight, but still too big to like, I was like, I'm yeah. sleeping with you tonight. <laughs> that would help their marriage. 
That's the magic key to any yeah, marriage. Exactly. It's an eight-year-old. A chunky eight-year-old between the two of them. It helped. It, I would say it saved their marriage, really. We're just going to put that out there. Um, so like I said, this book is laid out chronologically, and um, some of the most interesting and, and moving chapters are those when you remember both your grandfather's and your father's run for presidency. I, I want to I wanna give you a quote. It's, from, it's a chapter written by Jenna, and, and it says, quote, there are many breathless moments when your loved ones run for political office. We spent November's presidential election day in Houston. The next morning, it was like an existential death, where there was no wake or funeral, but the adults walked around grim. I remember my dad with tears in his eyes. And, and, and I think that that, I just, I just wanted to pull that out because it was, again, I'm struck time and time again in this book about just the depth of personal revelation in your guys' writing. So can you talk about writing that and, 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 and what that was like and how that, um, how that moment felt to you? Because even in reading it, it felt very raw and real. You know? Well, we adore our grandfather, and I think the reason why Barbara thought all grandfathers had mm. inaugurations was because he was really a grandfather to us. I mean, when we saw him, he was very present, and we've just reflected on this since being on the book tour. There was no cell phones, so he wasn't like on, you know, his c computer or, or on social media, he was with us and present. And so when he wasn't working, we didn't know that he had an important job to do. Um, and he really made us feel like a priority. I mean, he was the type of grandfather that would, would play um, and would ask us about ourselves. He wrote us all the time. I mean, he's still, and he can't anymore, but, and probably in the last 10 years, he, he hasn't been able to, but he did. And, um, and, oh yeah, that's a very, very 80s costume, Juicy Fruit. Um, yeah, but he, you know, even that, like he wanted us to be there with him on Halloween. Um, and so when, but I will say the, the interesting thing about elections is that they brought our family together. So we were so young, we were in the fourth grade. Yeah. And so we didn't really understand. I mean, we knew everybody was really sad, which made us sad. Yeah. But we didn't really understand the repercussions of it. But you did in the sense that it, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It was that, that personal yes. feeling. Because you, you were like, we're, can't be sad. And that yeah, was what breaks right. our heart. But that was what it always was. Mm -hmm. And I mean, our grandfather, you know, then became great friends with the person that beat him. I mean, I think that's one of the real... That's why we love him. That's the type of man he is, who would let something like loss um, and some ego um, be, be not as important as our country. And when, when they were asked to go and raise money for certain national, natural disasters, they did it. Yeah. Um, and I, so anyway, now I'm and like. And now the joke in our family is that Bill Clinton is the sixth Bush, Bush child. So, I mean, they like became that close. Our grandmother it, said and that to us And Bill two days Clinton ago. will say, yeah, she said that to us yesterday. That was yeah, yesterday. That was yesterday. <laughs> and Bill, Clin Bill Clinton will say that every family needs a black sheep. <laughs> I'm just learning so many things here with you guys. That's not in the book. That's just extra for being here. Um, I, I want to, you know, related to that, I think there's a big chunk of this book um, and you guys can kind of, I'm going to just put it out and then you guys can figure out where you want to go with it. Um, there's a big chunk in the book where it really talks about the vulnerability of being in the public, but also the vulnerability you feel for someone you love being in the public and being criticized and judged. Um, you know, I, I think, um, Barbara, you wrote in reference to your father's run, for office, throughout the recount and for years after, I became a turtle of sorts, a hard shell of self-protection over vulnerable love. And Jenna, you wrote that you, quote, always felt gutted when you hear your father being criticized. Um, can you sort of expand on that and talk about that? Because you don't ever, you know, while it's happening, like I said, it's just a headline and it's 
it's very easy for us to sort of judge and have our opinions, and it is politics, and we are all part of the conversation. But like you said, at the end of the day, there's a family behind there that is, that is very vulnerable, and I think all of us can relate to that. Well, we never saw, and we actually wrote a letter to Malia and Sasha Obama that really said this, because one, when you're the daughter of a president, you're not really, or we were not prepared, mm. um, even though our grandfather had been president, but we lived in Dallas, Texas. We, we lived in a three-bedroom ranch house. We rode our bikes to our public school. Our, our day-to-day life was just such a juxtaposition yeah. between that and what our grandfather, you know, his life in the Oval Office. It, we saw him twice a year, and it was magical, but we didn't know the pressure of really being a, a kid a teenager and having your dad become president. And our dad really gave us this, like any dad, you know, we said, but dad, we're not gonna be able to be normal. We can't have a normal college career. And he was, yes, you can have a normal college career. He he wanted to reassure us. So really neither one of us were prepared. Yes, <laughs> you can do anything that anybody else does. And like, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> and, and when he told you he was running, I feel like, you guys tried to talk him out of it. And we did, and we, we apologized. We to actually him. apologized two days ago for our behavior when he was telling us. <laughs> a public apology. It we was a cri- public we apology. cried. We started, we burst into tears in unison mm-hmm. when he told us he was running for president. Then we told him he was going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't put that in the book. <laughs> That's what we publicly apologized for. Yeah. And then we also told him, he was, I can't even say it that he was going to ruin our life. We were little jerks. We were 16-year-old jerks. We didn't, we just couldn't imagine. But but so the point is, you don't realize, nobody is going to realize what it's going to be like until it happens. You just can't prepare for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can, see, you know, try the best you can, but you can't. And, um, and for us, we always saw our dad as our dad. I mean, we can't, it's too, we love him. And we've had these years, 18 years before he was president. Um, of normal things, of him coaching our, you know, soccer and going, coming home from work and going for jogs while I rode my bike next to him. Like, those were the moments that we judged him on. We can't judge him. We're not equipped to judge him on political matters. It's not fair to us. Um, And so, and I do think we have a really thick skin now because we've had years of it. But um, when we heard people say mean things that were baseless, that we knew weren't at all true, um, that hurts because we adore him. Yeah, and I think um, uh, we really... I think that was the hard, that was the only thing that was tough. We we have our lives have been magical in so many ways. We've met amazing people. We've gotten to really travel around the world with our parents, especially at an age when we were in college and right after college, when you're trying to figure out what you want to do and how you fit in the world. That type of exposure is the greatest gift. Um, but I'd say the one thing that was more challenging was you never we never at least got comfortable hearing negative things about our dad. We love him too deeply to be comfortable with that. And I purposely chose to go away to a school for college where I didn't know anyone. I love challenges like that. I like being out of my comfort zone. And so I went to Yale the year that our dad was running for president. And I didn't know anyone. Um, And it was, it's an awkward time to go away to school in the first place when your dad is running for president. (laughs) And... I also chose to go to a very liberal campus, and I don't know if anyone at Yale besides myself voted for my dad. Um, (laughs) I'm not sure. I'm like looking over at the roommates, and they're like, sorry, no. (laughs) (laughs) And I really quickly had to at least get, do my best to divorce the personal from the political, because Yale is a political campus, and so, I, you know, there were in the room next door or any window that I looked out of, there were Al Gore posters in the room windows, which I didn't take personally, but it was really hard to not see them as, I knew they had nothing to do with me, but I, it still was just really in your face. And um, so it, I did kind of go inward more mm. because it's all I could really figure out what to do as an 18 year old when you love someone. Um, But that being said, really everyone was unbelievably respectful, and I do have two of my roommates here, and they, um, I write this in the book, 
that friendship can be about showing you a lot or making sure you don't see things that hurt you. And I think that my roommates did that. They were so protective of me and always with me. And it's something that I'm just so grateful for. Oh, that's making me cry. Yeah. Making me cry. And I'm so glad she's crying. She's been dehydrated for the last couple of days. <laughs> and I've been trying to make her cry and she's like, I can't do it. And I'm like, drink more water. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, by the way, there are a lot of moments in this book where I'm just like, I, I'm not, am I crying? Am I really doing this right now? Like, is this happening? Um, and, and I know why you're tearing because, you know, you're sort of um, reading that chapter about you being on campus um, on your own as a young girl. It is actually, it's quite, you know, I, I, you can imagine how overwhelming and alone and then to sort of have people reach out in a way that you don't expect. It, what, it did catch me off guard that the whole kind of writing of, of when you went to, to, to college. So I, I do understand that because as a reader, I'm like, yeah, that must have been terrifying. And like you said, yeah, you don't take it personally, but I mean, how can you not? I mean, at every moment and then you become this guarded version of yourself because you're just never sure, right, when to let that guard down. Do you think that that is part of, of what your, uh, what did you call it, her? Uh, how, elusiveness? Oh, elusiveness, yes, no, I yes. think she's private by nature, probably. Yeah. Our mom, what, or are you elusive because of that? <laughs> I am, I think I emerged from the womb more private. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and our mom is definitely more yeah. private, so yeah. Nature or nurture. Yeah. Um, but I mean, definitely in, I don't feel this way now at all, but in those years, yeah. I didn't want to talk about politics. I just didn't want to hear about politics or other people. Because as Jenna said, I mean, I already knew that I loved my dad. I didn't need someone else's opinion. I knew that opinion of mine was never going to change. Um, and, I, and I was comfortable with that, but therefore I didn't want someone to try to change it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because you talk about sort of being very protective about your dad and the criticism. And now I can't remember what the incident was. And tell oh, me the, if I've butchered this. The bumper this. sticker. Was it a bumper? Or something, something. One of you guys had done something and your dad had written a text or a letter oh. to you. Was it you? To in me, the, I, yeah, I thought you were talking about the bumper sticker that we laughed at that's, that no. said somewhere in Texas. <laughs> well, what was it? Somewhere in Texas. Um, a village was missing its idiot. <laughs> we read that bumper sticker in we DC like, and we were like, whoever mm. wrote this is we hilarious. Like, we, we like looked at each other and we were like, that's so mean. And then we were like, are they talking about dad? And then we were like, oh. <laughs> and we, we brought, we got one for him. Um, that, this is how your dad developed his thick skin, yeah, by well, the way. This is you too. He has a self deprecating sense yeah, of humor, yeah, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but okay, sorry. So I was. So do you remember that moment? I, 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 it's just coming to me now in like vague. Something had happened, and your dad had given one of you girls just a really great piece yeah. of advice about getting over, you know what I mean, making mistakes in public. Like yeah. the world, my dear, will go on, or something yeah, like so that. So I, um, yeah, I had a really horrible, um, I'm trying, now I'm trying to look for it though. Um, I was covering for NBC the um, Golden Globes, and it is a wild show. Oh, God. I and I, um, it's really hard, the worst, the but worst, I, yeah. um, I made a slip of the tongue that I felt horrible about, yeah. but it was just a, a, a mess up. Yeah. And, but I felt really bad because people were saying, of course, cause they're going to judge you much harshly. If you have a brain yeah. fart, it means something versus a brain fart, <laughs> you know? Like, I know. And luckily I work with the most supportive group of people who were like, we know that this meant nothing about yeah. your character, but people were saying it did. And that hurts. It just does. And I'm, you know, and I apologize, but my dad who doesn't even, you know, probably didn't even know the golden globes were on. Um, <laughs> I woke up to a text from him, which I'm trying to find. Yeah. And this was not the only text I have received from him. There's been times with work where I've been, you know, overwhelmed. And my, my mom will tell him, oh, Jenna's overwhelmed at this or that. And I'll get, like, this beautiful text that will basically... Okay, thank you. You're the best, sister. Um, 
Sorry, I'm making you search. No, it no. just brought something No, I've up read this before, yeah. and, I, and thank you for asking it. But um, I will get texts from him that's like, this is what's important. You know, you you have two beautiful daughters who need you. And, you know, this... And just like these beautiful texts that I've read to colleagues, and we've j both like wept. <laughs> um, and so he wrote me um, this. So I conflated two best picture nominees and called the film Hidden Fences instead of Hidden Figures. I hadn't even known I said it till after the show. It was, and by the way, I saw Pharrell Williams later, and he came up to me and he was like, everybody made this into a thing. I love talking with you. I didn't even hear it. You, uh, you, by apologizing, you know, like he was so kind. Yeah. So the people that were actually in the movies weren't, of, yeah, weren't offended. offended. Yes. Um, well, but anyway, yeah, so, so. Um, I was heartsick over having made this mistake, over the knowledge that some viewers thought I didn't care. I apologized the next morning. Waiting on my phone was a text from my dad. I hear the Twitter world is buzzing because of something you said. Here are some thoughts. It's no big deal. Your family loves you, which is a lot more important than one slip. I've made a lot of slips, and overall, they did not matter. The world is full of people who want to take someone down, but there are many more people who think you are great. So let it go. Be your charming, natural self. All will be well. Love you, Dad. And that uh, was really sweet. Right? That was sweet. See? It's lucky to yeah. have good people in your life that you're a and but Oh, cute. <laughs> I mean, our parents always allowed us to make mistakes, which is such a gift, you know? And now you yeah. realize with little kids, because you want to protect them, but we were allowed to not be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we were allowed to be ourselves, which, so you know, people are like, well, didn't you have, like, an Olivia Pope jump down and, like, fix things? And we were like, no, <laughs> um, we didn't. We were allowed to really just be us and and. All of that, you know, the embarrassments and the mistakes and that came with that allows us to be authentic human beings. And so it's a real gift that we have parents that comfort us when we do make mistakes and also yeah. love us and know that, that, you know, we are who we are. Yeah. Um, sort of on a bit of a lighter note, um, I wanted to also um, hear from both of you guys <clears throat> what it's like to date. Uh, when one, your father is a president of the United States, and two, you have like secret service following. I mean, could be kind of intimidating to a young young yes. quarter. You could kind of be like, if a we young could, sooner might be uh, out the door sooner. before he's even in the <laughs> it's door. Like that, a uh, secret service thing could could be a deal breaker for me. But I'm gonna. Go ahead and, I mean, like, you know, I just can't, it takes a special guy. It so, takes a special. So tell me about some of the, like, the, the funny, you know, things that happen uh, during your dating years. And, and, and then, of course, Jenna, you have to tell the funny stories poor about Henry. poor Henry. Henry Hager is really the comic foil in our <laughs> book. I mean, That's Jenna's husband. Yes. Um, it's a miracle I will that say, he ever asked. I mean, it's a miracle times a hundred yeah there's there we could have written just a sole book called Henry yeah. <laughs> um, times a hundred times a hundred I'm so sorry Henry there I so at Yale you walk everywhere that was great because I didn't have to go on dates like in the same car with our secret service <laughs> and um, but what I noticed is that my secret service and my roomie Emily over there knows them very well um, they turned into our brothers, sort of. And they were, they were the, acted the way that family members will, where they reserved their opinions about who I was dating until after the relationship had ended. <laughs> and then would, sh you know, and all my friends, and then would share everything. <laughs> and um, they were actually also very helpful with dating because often one of our friends would be upset about something or crying, and it was like, well, I mean, if you want to know the male perspective, ask the man that is sitting near us <laughs> and has been for the last four years yes. <laughs> knows you so really we well a lot of dating advice but yeah. really the best stories involve Henry I mean I do think we date and we dated it was sort of fine you know because because whatever the boys are in college and we're cute and funny um 
But, but by the way, it's a parent's dream now that I'm thinking yes. about it, right? It's like, I know what, what I actually thought about that. your daughters at the Secret Service? I thought about that. Like, I'm like, yeah. I have two beautiful little toddlers, and I'm like, wait, when they go to college, Will I have are they not going to have Secret <laughs> Service? <laughs> let's get on this. Yes. Let's, let's I'm like, I don't know out. how it's going to happen, <laughs> but I'd like them. Oh, yeah, they're so cute. Yeah. But I'm like, let's get them a Secret Service detail as soon as possible. Um, but poor Henry is, he's, and he's, he's darling and funny and so confident, but we met actually in DC and for some reason we, we lie about how we met or we, no, we don't. Um, but <laughs> like friends would ask us, they'd be like, so where'd you meet? And we'd be like at a bar. Um, but really he worked for my dad and I think one, he's not that political. So I don't know if it like embarrassed us the politics of it, um, or that he had like the bravado to ask me out. He had a cute girlfriend when I met him, and I just took care of that. Um. <laughs> she did not. This is a severe amount of bravado right here. She did not take care of her. I know, I didn't. <laughs> That'll be the pull quote in the they magazine article. Yeah, about I did it. They broke up. But, but anyway, he, um, Henry... I mean, there was too many things. In this book, you'll see. On our first date, I can, won't even get into details, but basically, the helicopter, Marine One, nearly landed on his car. <laughs> on the second date, his car ran out of, uh, of gas and rammed back into the Secret Service car. <laughs> and he had to go up and introduce... He didn't had never met the Secret Service, so the car ran out, and he was like, Hi, I'm, I'm Henry. They're um, like, we know. Yeah. <laughs> we're aware. We also knew you were going to run out of gas. Here's the cares, you know. $25. Yeah. Um, on one of our dates, um, and maybe I'll read this, we went, uh, I was a teacher in inner city D.C., and I was moving to Latin America to work with UNICEF, and Henry was going to school. He was going back to, to graduate school. And I was like, all right, well, I won't go if you're going to propose to me. Jenna. <laughs> It was like the ultimate. Made, yeah, made him a, an offer he couldn't refuse. Yeah, uh, except but he, he refused did. for like he five years. He was like, years. "Go to Latin America and have a great time." <laughs> but this was also <laughs> three years after Jenna had already proposed to Jenna proposed to Henry three months into the relationship. I know. I knew what I wanted. She knew what she wanted. It, I was standing there, and it was sort of in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> We were at a Christmas party, and Henry was overcome by holiday cheer, and he said to Jenna, I love you. And then it was clear that he did love her, but that he didn't mean to say, I love you. He turned red, he put his hand over his mouth, and Jenna elbowed me, and, she, and I watched it in slow-mo. I was like, please don't. She was like, I love you too. Let's get married. And I had to just walk away. I was like, I don't know if this is going to survive. I think this is it. <laughs> But they stayed together. We stayed together, and I she said... She continued to put the pressure so on. So we had the plan to move, and I was like, but you know what? I'll stay if you propose. And he's like, I mean, I'm not going to propose, but all right. Um, so, but one night, it was a Tuesday, and he was like, let's go to a dinner. I'll pick you up. And I was like, what is this about? You know, this is, was fancy. It was on a school night. Um, so we go to a restaurant, and there, this is a particular restaurant that makes fortune cookies with your own fortune, so you can tell them what to put in. But of course, my husband <laughs> didn't put it in early enough. <laughs> and so, and maybe his communication skills weren't ideal because he was going to write on it something like, go, and when you come back, I will be here, or something like that. But instead it said, don't go, stay here. Um, <laughs> And so they were out of, of, they couldn't get it in the fortune cookie, so they brought it in two glasses of champagne, and Henry is not a champagne, you know, he's like not at all a champagne guy. So I was like, oh, this is the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> the answer is yes. And he was like, no, what do you, no. Um, but unfortunately, um, when your dad is in the White House, and here I'll read, it's not just you and your boyfriend having a conversation in a restaurant. It's you, your boyfriend, and every other patron with an earshot. Thankfully, this was two years before the smartphone. So two women sitting next to us called the Washington Post, relayed the whole moment, including, apparently, their views of what we ate. So two mornings later, I awoke to this. 
A champagne bottle was popped. The question was not. <laughs> Clever. I mean, it's, it is. It's uh, a it good, almost rhymes, it's I mean. <laughs> Uh, Jen and Bush has been stepping out with Henry Hager for a year and a half now, a point when any young couple might mulling questions over <laughs> the future. So it's natural there may have been a little frisson as they sat down to dinner Tuesday at Asia Nora. The 24-year-old teacher beaded light green tunic, dark slacks. <laughs> Hot. <laughs> yeah, it's a teacher look. <laughs> and her beau, who turns 28 next week, ordered a lavish meal. Although I can promise you that if Henry was paying, it was not lavish. <laughs> I mean, I love him, but this was not lavish. Um, fellow patron said, then they shared it. As they shared a chocolate mousse, the waitstaff brought champagne. Jenna's flute with a mysterious note taped to the bottom. She read it and burst out laughing. I thought you were proposing, she hollered. I nearly, in parentheses, soiled my pants. <laughs> I know, my parents were so proud. A real lady. A real lady I was. Um, <laughs> Who knows what the note said? Witnesses gleaned that it was an inside joke Henry wanted to deliver in a fortune cookie, but he didn't get it ordered in time. <laughs> the restaurant's not sane. Anyway, there were a lot of moments like that. Yeah. For better or worse. But I, I, my language is I'm, it's better now, so don't worry. So you get the gist. There's, there's a couple, so... You it's know, hilarious. it's hilarious. I mean, what, what do you, you know what I mean? And Henry's like, why do I, why, like, he'll go to these things in New York, and he's like, y'all talked about me for 15 minutes. I'm like, I'm sorry, honey, but you're We're the trying first. to tone it down. At other book events, he's definitely, we've spoken about him for about 30 minutes. We're trying to lessen it. We're like, you're the funny part. <laughs> he is. Um, okay, so I have a stack of cards here. I know that... Um, we are already overdue um, in time, but I wanted to get to a few audience questions from people in the room as well as Facebook. This wow. first question comes from Mimi James via Facebook. What was your most memorable moment while at the White House? I don't know why that's a hard question to answer. Go, go ahead, you go. Well, in the, well, I was gonna take it broader of Dad's yeah. presidency. Um, a moment that is really memorable to me that I write about in the book is, um, is I went with my dad for the World Series after September 11th. He threw out the first pitch. And um, I went to school in New Haven and a big part of why I'm able to joke about my secret service is because we got to know them really well. And um, part of the reason that we got to know them really well is that I was with them on September 11th and they were all out of the New York field office. And their office was in World Trade Center Tower 7, which is one of the buildings that collapsed. It didn't get hit, but it collapsed on September 11th. So when my two Secret Service, Steve and Tony, when the second Twin Tower was hit, they came and got me immediately out of my dorm room and we knew we needed to get go somewhere where no one would know that we were. and. I was with all my secret servicemen who were talking to their family members in New York or making sure their colleagues were okay. And I was talking to my sister and we were really all going through it together and we were basically all crying together. And from then on, they really were my brothers. And um, we ended up going to this hotel off, a motel off the highway. And Steve, my main secret serviceman, his wife and his daughter came up from New York and she was five and she was jumping wildly on the bed. And it was such a stark, version in my head of her, you know, having no idea what happened. She was so excited to have a summer party with her parents in a hotel room and, you know, having no clue that what else was going on. And they were so generous. They went and got my roommates and brought them to spend the night with me because they knew that I was alone there, which was so sweet and unnecessary. So from then on, they really were my brothers. Um, and anyway, uh, quickly thereafter was the World Series in New York. And my dad had been invited to throw out their first pitch. And we grew up going to baseball games almost any night that we could as a family. It was really our thing, sitting next to each other. And my dad had never been to a World Series game before. And I remember being really scared. Um, if you think back then, when people were gathering, particularly in New York, it was there was a lot of fear thinking about how exposed everyone was to be in a stadium. And my dad was going to walk into the middle of the stadium totally exposed to throw the ball, and I remember being really nervous. 
and he wanted to throw a great pitch and he was worried because he was wearing a bulletproof vest and he wanted to make sure he could do a good job. And just I'll never forget that moment when like everyone in the stands was cheering USA. It was all New Yorkers so excited to watch the Yankees. And my dad walked out into the middle and he threw a perfect pitch. And it was like everyone in the stadium that had been hurting from September 11th like exhaled for the first time since then. And I just felt like as a daughter, I mean, I, I almost looked away. I almost felt like I couldn't look because I was fearing the worst. And once he threw it, it was like, that's my dad and he's doing exactly what I knew he would do because he's done that for me and my sister all of our life, which was just be strong and take responsibility. And I felt like everyone else in the stadium felt like that too. It was like one big exhale. So that's probably the most, the most memorable mm -hmm. moment to me. Well, I will just quickly say that the people that work at the White House are, are what make it feel like a home. And the first time we walked into the White House, my mom claims, she said this yesterday, two days ago, that we walked by ourselves. I was like, Mom, we were seven. Um, she was like, no, y'all walked in. We stayed at the parade, and you went by yourself to the house. I'm like, but unaccompanied in D.C? Yeah, she's like, there's we a big like, house down, a white house. Yeah, you'll find it, 1600 Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> But she still claims that we were unaccompanied, but whatever. Um, we were by ourselves when we got up there somehow. So maybe she walked us and dropped us off, I assume somebody did. Um, and the, the White House florist, Nancy, said, okay, well, since nobody's with you all, um, I will take you down, and why don't you make some bouquets in the flower shop for your grandparents' bedside? And of Aww. course, for like seven-year-olds who loved DIY before yeah. DIY was a thing. Yeah. Like other, it was called crafts back then. It was called crafting <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> we, we got to make these flower bouquets, and what was so incredible is that she then did the flowers for my wedding. Um, she's passed away now, but um, I think those are the, the things that you miss are the people. Yeah. Okay, this one is from someone in the audience here. Do you still wear matching outfits sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's such a good question. No. No. <laughs> no, we don't, but... We like to coordinate. Yes. Oh, and this is the photo. Oh, yes. And one thing I'd like everyone to do is if you really look closely at the left belt loop, oh, you'll yes. see a... Um, a little metal circle, which I had a matching fanny pack for these shorts. It was also denim, a light denim. So no, we do not, but maybe we will. Well, we like to wear the same, yeah. No, I mean, maybe I we'll could match. see it. I could actually see it happening. Um, Sarah. We have the same bathing suit. Oh, we have worn matching outfits. We wear a matching bathing suit. Yes, I bought it for her. <laughs> um, this is from Sarah in the audience. Uh, this is a question more focused towards Barbara, but Jenna can answer as well. Thank you, Sarah. With your focus on global health and resources, what do you feel is the most important thing people need to understand in order to give to such a needy crisis? It's a good question. Um, well, I will, so I never thought I would work in global health. I, I wanted to be an architect or work in design, and that's what I thought I was gonna do with my life. And then I was lucky to take two weeks off when I was a junior in college. I had a summer internship at a design firm. And I was lucky to take two weeks off and travel with my parents. And they were traveling for the launch of PEPFAR, which is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And all of y'all are responsible for it if you pay your taxes. And um, what PEPFAR was going to do was to provide free antiretroviral drugs for people living with HIV. At that time, if you lived on the continent of Africa and you were HIV positive, it didn't matter how well connected you were or how wealthy you were, you could not get the drugs that you needed to live. They were not distributed there because pharmaceutical companies didn't believe they could make a profit. And so something that in the United States was just a chronic illness was a death sentence. And I'm sure y'all remember the headlines of millions of people dying in this fear that tens of millions of people were going to die if they didn't get treatment. So I went with my parents on this trip and when we landed in Uganda, it was just a very, as cliche as it is, it really changed my perspective on the world. There were hundreds of people waiting in the streets for drugs that we had had in the United States for years. 
And my mom and I were standing at a health clinic and a Ugandan mother brought her daughter there. And she had dressed her up and she was wearing her nicest white and lavender katanga dress. And I said to the mom, you know, your daughter's so beautiful, is she three? And the mom said, no, she said something like, no, she's seven, she's not little because she's young, she's little because she's sick. And it was this very defining moment in my life because I was standing with my mother, she was with her mother, and for no fault of her own, she was basically born in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I was born at the right place at the right time. I was born in the United States and I was born healthy. And so from then on, I quit studying architecture and I ended up working in global health. And the reason that I did was, it's just such a luxury actually to live in a time where we have drugs to make sure people can live a dignified life. We have the knowledge and the education and information we need to keep people healthy. We just need to make sure that systems serve those that they're meant to serve. And that's what I work on every day in global health. I, I founded an organization called Global Health Corps that invests in young leaders to solve global health issues. And I say all that because I think people often think of global health issues and they think this is so overwhelming and this is so depressing. And actually, there is so much that we, I mean, we will, there will be an AIDS-free generation in our lifetime, and I strongly believe that. And there's so many resources we already have. Thank you. <laughs> and um, and I, the reason that I wanna say this is because there's so much in global health is solvable, and people can live very dignified lives no matter where they are born. We just need to make sure that we're utilizing the tools that we already have well. And I hope all of you know that because that means that we can do a lot more in our wild and wonderful life. Um, thank you. I think we're gonna start to wrap it up and I have a great audience question, a simple one, but I thought very nice to end on. What is your happiest memory involving your sister? And then we'll end the night on that. I love that question, whoever asked it. The, by the way, a lot of Good really, questions. yeah, I'm yeah, those were sorry great to, questions. Get to get to more yeah, of these. Thank you, they were the best ones we've had. Yeah, yeah. The most really regal good. group, as we said. Um, <laughs> what is the happiest memory involving my city? I mean, I have hundreds of thousands. I mean, I probably have millions. Um, I had a happy memory today where we woke up and drank a coffee in bed, and then we, um, I mean, everything is happy. We went, we were in Houston this morning, and so we went um, and joined a group of volunteers to rebuild a house for Harvey. And the family that was moving into the house in December was with us, and that was so much fun. Mm. And we're real cat people, and we also found two kittens on the building site, and obviously had to snuggle with them. I mean, everything's happy. I ha I'm just happy being with my sister. Well, I love that it's present. I mean, I think um, growing up with Barbara, well, even recently, she has the biggest heart. So we were just flying from Auburn, Alabama to New York, and Brian Stevenson, who's the head of the Equal Justice Initiative, was on the plane, and I've read about him, of course, but I don't, and I've seen pictures of him, but I would not have recognized him. And she's like, there is Brian Stevenson. And everybody was still getting on the plane. Like, we had just gotten on, and I was like, oh, great. She goes, I'm gonna go thank him for his work. I'm like, you're gonna battle all of these people <laughs> getting on an airplane? I'm like, that is gonna be, are you sure? Like, right now? She's like, I need to thank him for his work. And so she got oh. up, and she, battled the people getting on the plane, which as you know, can be a very stressful place. Um, and she was, I heard him say to him, you know, I just wanna thank you, your work is so important and on your darkest days, no, it's, I, you know, you have one fan and me and I, I and she has many fans, but um, I really appreciate what you do. And I, that's the type of sister I have who, with me, you know, she has a huge heart. She chooses to use it in the most vulnerable places in the world. But also, if she has a compliment or something kind to say, she's going to say it. So luckily for me, she laughs at all my jokes. <laughs> I laugh at every one of her. I actually think that I've probably enabled her my whole life. She has. I laugh at every one of her jokes. <laughs> She totally has. She makes me think I'm funnier than I actually am. Um, She's funny. I am, but you make me think I'm like the funniest. <laughs> um, but that, like having a, a partner um, who has your, who has that type of heart um, is incredible. And I think that's why we wanted to write this book is that um, I think there could be more people like Barbara standing up and thanking people for their work. So thank you. Well, it's yeah. true. It's true. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all, thank you all so for coming. Thank, thank you so much for so coming. Much. Thank, thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen.
Jenna and Barbara Bush, authors of Sisters First.